on this computer. Hello, everyone. You're welcome to ING Research Academy. ING Research Academy is a, co is a, a collection of doctors um, either practicing in residency or about to get into residency. We also have fellows. We have one or two professors here. Yeah, we're majorly from you know, the developing country, uh, like they describe us, Africa, South Asia, Asia, North America. We're all scattered all over the country and all over the world. People trying to get into residency or trying to get into academia or trying to get into one thing or another in this advanced world. Um, 99% of us are doctors. And then we're trying to figure out how do we get in. A lot of us spend so much time before we could get into residency, not knowing that there are other alternative pathways. Um, so I had a conversation with Dr. Chu and Dr. Lepke, um, who Dr. Chu, who happens to be my mentor, and Dr. Lepke, who happens to be a friend. And they were like, sure, we're going to share information on this. So we're going to talk robustly on how and um, what are these choices that we have? It's going to be like a joint conversation between three or four. That Chu is going to focus on the assistant position pathway, and Dr. Lepke is going to focus on um, the imprenada pathway. Further introduction about them: they are family physicians in training. Dr. Chu is almost gone; has a couple of weeks, I would say, left. And right. Dr. Lepke, not only is a family physician, he has practiced intensively in. Um, in Puerto Rico. So he knows the Puerto Rican pathway. He practiced several before he transitioned from Puerto Rico to become begin his residency in the US. All of our conversations are personal opinion. We're not representing our residency program. We're not representing the American Medical Association. We absolve ourselves from any liability from our opinion. Everything we want to say is just purely opinion based and uh, not saying in terms of this should not serve, serve as legal advice. We also post our views on Facebook, on YouTube, so that people can, generations unborn can, can benefit. My name is Dr. Kobe Edwards. Lengthy, lengthy introduction. Dr. Chu, how are you? Hi, I'm okay. Okay, I think your volume is a little bit low. Dr. Lecky, testing the microphone. Let's see if your volume is fine. <laughs> yeah, that, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Good evening, guys. How you guys doing? Hey, Dr. Chu, how you doing, my brother? Good hey. evening. Good evening. Good evening, guys. How you guys doing? Good. I probably wasn't speaking loud enough. Is this good? Yeah, we're good now. Okay. Uh, so let's let's start from you, Dr. Chu. Um, Coming into, into the U.S., I know you were probably born and raised here, but we just came into the U.S. trying to navigate this pathway. There are options that are, that are left for us. The primary option is write your step one, step two, get your ECFMG for us, and then <laughs> get your certification, get into residency. But this Mama, is you. This I is, want to tell you how to uh, Please, can you mute yourself if you're not speaking? Thank you. So this, but that is theory. That is really theory. In reality, we spend years of struggle. The world is struggle. Sometimes very few percentage are very lucky to get in the first try. What other options do we have? Um, yeah, so I mean, I recommend that you try to get all the clinical experience you can. Um, me straight out of residency, I'm a, I am a US resident, so that I had that on my side. Uh, but I did come from a Caribbean medical school with low board scores and no U.S. clinical experience and no U.S. research experience. Um, luckily enough, I was through church. I was able to find um, uh, my mentor in church. His father was a Cuban doctor who had a clinic in Hialeah. And through there, I started becoming a medical assistant. And on Craigslist, out of all the places I would find more medical assistant jobs or clinical assistant jobs or clinical research assistant jobs, got published, um, tried the match several times with no luck, um, and then went to St. Louis to become an assistant physician, uh, worked in an urgent care there. A lot of this is just taking the opportunity that life gives you and making the best of it and trying to formulate some sort of coherent narrative of experience in your resume to make it look like you had the intention of doing it all along, whereas maybe you didn't. Yeah. 
and finding the connections that can get you into residency. So Dr. Kobe is a resource. He's going to be in residency for a good amount of three years. So any kind of connection that you have to a, a U.S. residency, using that as a as a stepping stone. I want to share my screen really quick because I have um, this is basic. What's this? Yeah, you could um expand your screen. I feel like my like something happened with my shred them in a pool. That's what happens when you're about to leave residency. Your laptop begins to malfunction. It's time to upgrade. <laughs> That's what happens when you're about to leave residency. Your laptop begins to malfunction. It's time to upgrade. <laughs> Victoria, come upstairs. <laughs> it's time to right. No worries. I'm not, I'm not sure what happened there. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, absolutely. I can hear you. So uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Oh my lord, what is that? Are you guys hearing the shred them in the pool? What is that? Yeah. Let's see if I mute if it's going to stop. Can you unmute? And see if it's still there. I mean, I can still, I can still hear it. I just don't. I think I've been hacked or something. I don't, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Here, let me, let me log off and log back in. All right, sure. While we're waiting for him to log up and log back in, Dr. Lecky, um, if you can uh, give us a little background, and you know, we we dive into the details of the conversation, and when he comes in, he's gonna switch. You're mute. Next time, mute. It happens to all of us. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, so like I was saying, good evening to everyone down here from Miami. So my name is uh, Dr. Lepke Martinez Velez. Um, I actually first year resident of family medicine uh, with Dr. Edwards, good buddy of mine. I call him Papi over here. He's my good brother. Um, actually, so my story, I'm going to try to be a quickly as I can. Actually, I'm born and raised in Puerto Rico. As you know, Puerto Rico is actually part of the United States. Um, and actually, I did, I did my pre-med in Puerto Rico. After I did my pre-med in Puerto Rico, I went to Dominican Republic to study medicine. You guys are going to probably ask, why did he went to Dominican Republic? So in my way, it was I was going to actually start medicine quicker, and it was going to be the cost effect that was going to be less than studying in Puerto Rico. So literally I did my four years over there, then came to the United States and did some of serviceship. I did some rotations uh, actually in San Antonio and I took my boards afterwards. Uh, I had literally an option to go back to Puerto Rico and do like we say the internship in Puerto Rico. It's called uh, the Internado Criollo, which it consists of doing one year serving for the government in Puerto Rico um, and after that year, you'll be uh, eligible to get your Puerto Rican license. How do you get your Puerto Rican license? Well, first of all, you need to have all, all three steps or you're going to be taking all three tests from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico also makes this, their own medical license test. <laughs> like literally something like taking the steps, but a little bit more easier, I say. You also have the three, three also tests. So in my case, I had my boards. So actually, after I finished my boards, I just went to Puerto Rico. I um I actually tried to match for an internship in Puerto Rico because you also have to match for internship over there. I did my internship actually in the south side of Puerto Rico called Dr. Pilas Hospital. It's, it's in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Did my whole year. And after I finished, I actually was eligible to get my license. After I started getting my license, Actually, I started working in Puerto Rico. I started working in ERs and also as general physician in some different clinics. So it's a, another pathway a, a lot of people are also interested in getting. Because uh, a lot of people, what they are trying to do is, since they don't pass the boards, the steps, or they, it's really, really hard in that position to start going to residency. So a lot of people, 
what they do, they go to Puerto Rico, they try to do the first year internship, they try to get the license over their work, also get a little bit of money because, you know, this whole process about application to the United States residency programs and everything is really expensive. So for me, it was more of that, getting a little bit of money at the same time, getting that experience. So one of the good things that helped me get into residency now is that I, oh, I've always been working in medicine, yeah. ER, or a physician. So for me, it's a little bit easier in a way I never did research. I wasn't like Dr. Shu or Dr. Edwards. They, they're really good. They did research and they did other type, type of stuff. For me, it was more staying working as a doctor, like a general doctor, your doctor, and, and working in my, in my island of Puerto Rico. There's a lot of also options you can have after you finish doing that internship and getting also that license in Puerto Rico. Because now with that license, you can transfer to you know, the United States, some special states. You could also transfer that and you can be working here also in the United States with that license. You will not be working as, for example, as any type of specialty, but you also be working as a general doctor in some origin care and ERs over here. So that's another uh, idea or another options a lot of people could think about in the future if they don't go or enter to any residency programs. So in my point of view, there's a lot of options. It's a really good option going to Puerto Rico. Uh, you learn a lot of stuff. You will work a lot. And it's a really good way to stay always practicing medicine at the same time. Because that's right. going to help you for the other steps. And at the same time, for the next step to go into the residency. My way was that. That helped me a lot to try to get my interviews over here and try to get for my, my best fit, which was what, right here in the United States. Amazing story, really amazing. There's a lot of questions I want to ask, but let me give Dr. Chu an opportunity to, you know, talk. Yeah. And then we're all going to be throwing the questions here and then see how we can maximize this 30 minutes or 35 minutes that we're going to talk. I want to okay. ask, how do I even start? How do I get off from my home, go to Puerto Rico? What are the programs? How much do they even pay? Can I can they pay me something to sub to, to subsist my life? How long is the program? When I finish the program, when I come to the US, where specifically can I work? Like, can I work in the prison? Can I work in um in um, the military hospital? Can I work in Florida? You know, a lot of questions. And then how does it make me a better person? You've already said it, it lowers the bar for you to get into residency because in your resume, you're already practicing, like you have recency of practice. So it, it, it takes away that 10 years of graduation from you, for 20 years, you have recency of practice. So we're going to go into those questions. Dr. Chu, you have some other pathway for us. Um, uh, I mean, Lepke sounds... Uh... Lepke's pathway sounds a little bit more feasible. I know a lot of these are, uh, for the majority of, of your uh, listeners, they will be foreign medical graduates. Uh, for Missouri, you have to be a resident or a citizen of the United States, and then you have to have completed the steps within the last three years after graduation. or um, And then you have to have not done a postgraduate residency. That I was looking at the Tennessee one. Apparently, in Tennessee, you would have had to have done a residency in your home country, and then you could still you still have to apply for a visa, and then you'd have to um, get a sponsor sponsoring physician. So the I think the main the main uh, two choking points for obtaining these licenses and, and getting to work in the U.S. is obtaining a visa and then obtaining a sponsoring position. Um, and so you utilizing your contacts within the states who know doctors who are willing to um, help people from their home country because they've been through the process and they know the suffering that goes through of trying to apply for these things. Um, that'd be the best bet as far as once you get your visa approved. Um, I send over a couple of um, uh, states that have these graduate physician uh, av availability. I think it's like five or seven states around there. Mm. Um, and I would just encourage you to look through all the different uh, state boards. So if you go to the Arkansas Medical State Board or whatever and look at their graduate physician and their requirements for each one and see which one makes is the most feasible for your situation. 
Um, because speaking about our own experiences is great, but we actually have, um, we actually had the the privilege of being your citizens or, or we had connections in different ways. So it, it's just uh, looking how to navigate through these pathways that are seldomly known through your contacts and through your feasibility of getting a visa and your feasibility of getting a sponsoring position. Dr. Chu, from from this experience, from this uh, explanation, it seems like there are like five states that offer the assistant uh, assistant physician pathway. Do you have any idea? Because money is one of the driving factors. I don't know about other people, but sometimes for me, um, sometimes we come in and then we are we don't have you know like support system. We're looking for something we're going to do so that we can also raise funds, like Dr. Lepke said. These assistant physician training pathway, like how long do they last and are you going to be paid? Did you get any information about your payments? Why you um, Yeah, I got so I got paid very poorly. I was paid uh, 17 an hour. Uh, granted, it was in St. Louis, which is a cheaper city. And then uh, as I was more involved in the job, I got a little bit higher to up to like 20 an hour, 25 an hour. Um, it was just enough to live. I'm a single guy. I don't have kids or a family. So it wasn't something that I had to like support children or anything like that. Um, but it, it's definitely a risk because you are taking on, um, you know, the time of gaining experience versus the opportunity of actually getting into residency just because that experience is valid, uh, isn't necessarily guaranteed. So if you were to get an experience, um, I would say try to get around a residency program or or like parallel to a residency program where your experience is going to be observed by interns, residents, or attending physicians or program directors who will see you meet, see your work ethic and get to know you personally and then potentially have an opening there, um, which is, uh, I mean, a lot of our the people who are accepted into our program actually work in IMC, our outpatient clinics for a year as medical assistants. And then they subsequently get into the program through, through, through that way. Um, so it's, it, especially if you're an older physician and you're old, you're, you have low board scores and you have very little clinical experience, the best bet would be gathering relationships that are um, going to showcase your, your skill set in a way that's more appealing than just, you know, being screened out by the, by the NRMP because, by the NRP NRMP algorithm which states you know it puts a year of graduation cutoff or a USMLE cutoff. Mm -hmm. uh, Amazing. Amazing. Um, Dr. Lecky, you know, like we said, we're going to be shuffling back and forth. And for anyone in the group, if you have any questions, um, these two guys are great guys. I promise them that we're not going to share their information so that people don't bombard them. You could send me emails and then I'm going to forward it to them. But you can also unmute your mic and ask them directly why they're here. After the program, like I promise, I'm not going to expose them to, if, so I'm not going to expose their information if they don't permit me. And then um, you could send me an email and I'll forward it to them. Uh, but you can unmute yourself, raise your hands, ask any question you want to ask. Dr. Lepke. Yeah. In Puerto Rico, how is life affordability? I I just came from Nigeria. I have like two thousand dollars. What can I afford in Puerto Rico? What's what's the reality? Okay, I pick up my bag. I get to Puerto Rico. What's like the average rental? How do I settle in? How do I find the hospitals? So 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 actually, to to find hospitals in Puerto Rico, that's a really good question because actually the life in Puerto Rico has getting a little bit more difficult in the way of cost, money wise, economically. And usually internships in Puerto Rico, most of them, they don't pay much money, to be honest. There's some of them that even you, it's zero dollar. They don't pay nothing, nothing for you monthly. So it's really hard if you're going to try to do that transition. For example, get into an internship to a, a town that you have never lived, don't know no one, and you need to pay rent. So I understand that. For my, in my case was different. My case was that, thank God I have friends in the town I was going to go, did the internship. I got, I had, I was paid 400 550 actually monthly 
and I found like an apartment. They left it for like three fifty for four hundred dollars. For me, it was good because actually I had food in the hospital. I had other amenities in my apartment, so I was good. It was from the apartment to the to the hospital, from the hospital to the apartment. So when a person who's gonna literally go to Puerto Rico with that mind focus to do the internship or getting into an internship, it's it could be done. And afterwards, as soon as you get your license, you start working, you start earning much, much money. Oh. Um, it's a good way. How do you find internships in Puerto Rico? You write internships, hospitals in Puerto Rico. You're going to find a whole list of all the hospitals in Puerto Rico that you're going to be able to be applied. There are two, two time frames that you can be applying to in Puerto Rico for internships. One starts in January. Some hospital starts in January and other hospital starts in July. So if you guys had thinking of doing this process, you gotta look into yourself. When would I would like would be better for me to try to go in an internship? January or July? January uh, to January, July to July. So that will be the whole process. Now, as soon as you guys finish the whole process, they are new every morning. Great. Can you guys hear me? Yep. So as soon as you guys finish the whole process for the internship and as soon as you guys getting get your license it's really good on also why because the hospital the same hospital that saw you guys work through the whole year they mostly offer jobs to those doctors who just recently graduated so you can start working in the er or any type of work as you can a general physician and you start earning better better money i've heard doctors right now in puerto rico are earning like a hundred dollars an hour in the er oh wow okay. so that's pretty good money oh, wow. that's pretty good money now you're gonna be doing 12, 16 hour shifts. It's not like a, a easy shifts or stuff like that. When I when I worked, I was doing it about 12 hour shifts. I was getting about 85, 95 dollars an hour. Now I know I know they're getting 100 and 120 easy. Okay. So as the worst process is doing the internship. As long as you guys finish it, get your license, even though you don't got the steps or you take the Puerto Rican boards. Take it, get the license, start working in Puerto Rico. And at the same time, you're going to be earning much, much better money. It's going to be a better life for you guys and for your whole family. So it's a really good process to do it. You just got to be a little bit of patient and start looking. At the same time, like I said before, you go into the Google and you write internships in Puerto Rico. You're going to find a whole list of the whole hospitals. There's more than 10 hospitals in Puerto Rico right now. Different areas, north side, south side, east and west side, the whole Puerto Rico. Okay. Usually the hospitals that pay the most are the north side. There's a hospital actually in the north side who pays like 1500 or 1200 a month. But you got to think that the area of the north side is the most expensive for rent. So you need to know how to balance that, okay? Yeah. There is a lot of options, a lot of ways you guys could, could do it, and it's a really good opportunity, trust me. Really good. Lepke, why don't you uh, speak on the cultural barrier and the language barrier that they might come into and the logistics of of the Puerto Rican, uh, you know, the having all the documents and, and getting all, all of it done in a slow process because of it being Puerto Rico. So so actually for me, being a, a, a Puerto Rican, you know, racing and uh, being born in Puerto Rico, I'm an American a U.S. citizen. So actually, uh, paper-wise, I'm I born with my passport and everything. So for me, that transition was a little bit easier, okay? At the same time, if you guys would like to go to Puerto Rico and practice, also in Puerto Rico, we don't have any type of restriction that way. You guys can go in, practice, uh, do your uh, your internship. Even if some hospital asks for any type of visa, some of them do, some of them don't. So you got to look at that really uh, wisely in detail. I do see that a lot of hospitals in Puerto Rico are at least asking for the first step. Because they want to see people taking the steps or a divorce from the states, because that gives them a little bit more credential. Cultural wise, Puerto Rico is fully Spanish, but at the same time, we talk a lot of English. So right. it will be great for you guys. Why? Because if you guys, I know you guys, most of you guys, all of you guys talk English, you're going to learn Spanish in a whole year. Trust me. And at the same time, it's going to help you evolve for the next step. If you guys are going to plan to come to the United States and do residency, especially in the South side, like we are right now, Miami, that literally 90, 95% of everyone talks Spanish. So it's going to be a great transition from you guys starting at that point and developing, getting better and better and better. Amazing. You're gonna love, if you go to Puerto Rico, you're going to love the food. Food-wise, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, 
Amazing. So, beaches, everything. So it is amazing. Great. Dr. Chu, there's a question for you in the, in the floor. I believe the other three questions have been answered, the language barrier and the culture. Um, so for the physician assistant position, do we have to get a graduate degree? And for everyone, it's an open session. Like I said, these guys are greatly chill people. Open your mic. Let's have this conversation. Let's ask all the possible questions. There are two people who have witnessed the two pathways. And um, that's a cheap. What do you have to say? Uh, so I posted the the states that actually have uh, the, uh, it's not physician assistant, it's assistant physician. So it's the, you have to get that right. Because if you put P physician assistant, you're just going to get a whole bunch of graduate programs. But if you put assistant physician license on Google and you put these several of these states, um, you're going to get the, the alternative pathway where you can become, where you're a graduate physician, you've taken some of your steps, and then you're getting into tr trying to be under a supervising physician. Um, just to be clear, this isn't a, a pathway to practice independently. Like the uh, the difference between Lepke's uh, way and my way is that Lepke actually became a practicing physician once he finished his internship, whereas I um, would ha have to be indefinitely under a supervising physician unless I got into a graduate physician program. Um, so, uh, or unless I got into residency, basically. So um, you have to take that into account. Uh, Lepke's pathway is alternate, uh, is ultimately more feasible in terms of finances in the long term, um, but it may be more difficult because of the language barrier and the cultural barrier. Mine is more feasible in gathering clinical experience because there is a language barrier and potentially some of the the states may have uh, populations that you're familiar in serving. Um, but at the same time, getting that sponsoring physician and then ultimately having that experience translate into a residency spot is another uphill bat. Amazing. So many questions coming up. Uh, guys, I encourage you to um... Come to Mike. Let's hear your voice. It's also time to network and um, ask other questions around this topic and even beyond this topic. Dr. Chu, before we go to the questions on the on the panel, do you think that the assistant physician thing helped you get into residency? Did you have any role to play at all? Did it in any way affect the way people uh, look at you? People assess your assess your application during the era. Same question we go to Dr. Lepke also. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I didn't have any relevant clinical experience uh, prior to becoming an assistant physician and working in an urgent care. I had only clinical research experience. Um, I was very fortunate to be interviewing during COVID. So the benefit for me was that I was a singular applicant within the hospital that was empty of other sub-interns or other students uh, during a very hectic uh, influx of patients. And then I was able to showcase my skill set to interns, residents. And I fortunately had a family member within the same residency program that advocated for me. So it was a mixture of uh, like a perfect storm of having a little bit of extra income because COVID gave me a paycheck protection program as an independent contractor, um, being able to use that paycheck to do an externship, having a family member within that externship, being culturally and linguistically capable of navigating that demographic, um, and then being a singular applicant because of COVID as well. So uh, I couldn't have orchestrated that any in any way other than just have being at the right place at the right time and uh maintaining my application and my and the attitude of wanting to continue applying i applied five separate times um so it, it gets discouraging your heart gets broken you start losing your resolve people start telling you to do a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant or any other license to get some money coming in um, so persistence and luck and connections, uh, but yeah, it did help me. It did, I mean, I know I, that was a long-winded question, but it did help me, but it was one factor out of many.
Right. We know that, of course, we know that there are several factors that are put in play when the program directors at the committee are looking at our applications, uh, whether it's in fellowship or is in residency. Like I said, many of us here are in different stages. We have, we have also fellows and we have a professor that just joined us uh, uh, from Ghana. Uh, so, But he's also trying to get into the whole process altogether. Um, before we go to Dr. Lucky to answer that stem of the question, there are some people who are in the group. We're over 400 in number, and a lot of people are having difficulty in logging in. Uh, probably what happened to Dr. Chu, it say it was it, it it gives that zoom gives the error. I think they said the error is um let me see. Unable to log in or something redirecting them. I truly don't know how to solve that. Um I guess I just yeah, I can hear you. Tell them to sign in through Google. I, I just signed in through my Google account. Oh, okay. So for those people, please, someone should just send a message for them to sign into their Google account first before they log into Zoom. I think that helps to uh, eliminate that barrier because, you know, it happens all the time when we're having these mass meetings. We're over 400. Everybody's trying to log in at the same time. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Dr. Lecky, did it help in any way? Definitely, definitely. Uh, not only for me was actually staying practicing uh, medicine as a doctor and learning more stuff during the time I was doing. It was also like Dr. Shu said, also is knowing the right people and knowing what to do at the great time because all of us actually have our own stories, you know, to where we are right now. You know, we had to work hard, we had to study hard, we had to, we had to do a lot of stuff, connections, knowing people. Um, doing interviews, working, getting that money also to help this whole process because it's something you guys got to think about. It's it's a really hard process to our pocket, so everyone's pocket. This whole mm -hmm. process of doing uh, interviews and matching and looking for residency and everything like that. For, for me, it was a combination of a lot of stuff. First of all, working and staying as a doctor, knowing that clinical clinical knowledge was number one, and it helped me also in my resume when I showed it, you know? Right. Second of all, um, getting and actually earning the money I was doing in Puerto Rico to help me go to my next step of application, getting more and more, more variety of hospitals, trying to apply more in the whole United States and Puerto Rico. So for me, it was a little bit, a little bit more easier, even though it's really expensive. And at the and third and most of the knowing people. Actually, I also had a friend in the in the program who was going also through the through the residency that also you know talked to me and recommended me the, the program. So for me, it was a little bit more easier trying to apply to that program. But it's a combination of a lot of stuff. You guys gotta understand you cannot only have one thing. You gotta have the whole package to right. try to be more successful in the whole process. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Brilliant responses. Lots of questions coming in. Uh, our allocated time is thirty minutes. We just have like 10 minutes to wrap up, uh, but as many as Dr. Chu can take in the question link, I know he's good at combining center with uh, Dr. Lecky. You could just yeah. scroll through the, first, the chats and then we could pick up all the, some of the questions that are pertinent and we'll address them like point by point. We have less than 10 minutes, so I could free them to do their thing. Um, the one question I want to ask while you're looking at the options you want to answer in the question bank is, in the US, as someone who trained in Puerto Rico. Oh, yes. Someone who did his internship, not training, in Puerto Rico, or someone who has a Puerto Rican license. When you come to the US, are there options for you to work here? And what are those specific options? Do you yes. have any idea? I know there's. You know, yes, there are. Yeah. Yes, there are. So there's some. There's a number of states in the United States right now that they take the Puerto Rican license. The whole process you have to do is you got to get into uh, with the company or the hospital or the urgent care you're going to be working and make sure you make the transition of that license to the United States. You got to pay a different fee because you got to change the license and stuff like that. But you can transition from Puerto Rico to different states. I do know you can work in Florida. I do know you can work in Texas. And I do know you can work in New York, those three states. And I have, I have a lot of friends of mine who has come from Puerto Rico and worked over here. They've been working right now in ERs. They have been working also in urgent care, and they are also have been working different types of, of, of clinics, okay? As this a general is, 
This is amazing. So, you know, information is power. We never knew that you could actually go to Puerto Rico where you don't need to write step one, step two, or step three, or probably step one alone. Get your license, you know, put in the hours, one year, get your license, and then come back to the U.S. in Florida, yeah. in New York, and then you begin to practice. I don't know how much you are paid, but I believe they, they will not be paid chicken. Uh, oh, yeah, they're getting paid pretty good. I just had a friend of mine who just signed in Orlando. He's, he signed for... 155,000 a year and they oh, gave wow. him a business for signing like for 20,000. So he's not doing bad as a general doctor and he's not oh. doing ER. He's just working in urgent care in a, in a clinic, eight to five. Amazing. Dr. True, you have some questions you've identified there that you want to touch base on? I mean, they were asking the difference between assistant physician and medical assistant. So medical assistant is you're not practicing as a physician. You are just you're like transcribing for a physician. Um, in some places, you might be getting like a general history and physical, but you're not making an assessment. You're not making a plan. You're not prescribing medicine. Um, as an assistant physician, you're a graduated physician working under a supervised, under a supervising physician. And with that license, you're able to prescribe medication and you are able to practice as a physician. Mm -hmm. Um so I know it's confusing because there's another another license called physician assistant, um, and a lot of people get those two confused. But assistant physician, like I said, is is one special license within the states that I posted above, uh, specifically Arizona, Arkansas, Idaho, Kansas, Louisiana, Missouri, Tennessee, and Utah, that you can work under a supervising physician, and um, and then progress from there. Thank you so much. There's a question. Can we get uh, guest speakers contact email? I promise them that we're not going to expose them to undue solicitation just because of their privacy. Uh, so we're going to drop the general house email, imgresearchconsortium at gmail.com. If you have any question, just say, hey, question for Dr. Chu or question for Dr. Lecky. I promise you I'm going to send it to them. They're going to yeah. respond and I'll forward it back to you. Um, a lot of other questions that are pouring into the group. Uh, we may not be able to take all of them. In summary, Dr. Chu, uh, and then prepare your summary, Dr. Lepke, so that I can free you for the day. Can you ask the question, please? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Toro's hand is up. Dr. Toro, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am so sorry that I cannot, I'll use my video right now. So um, thank you, Dr. Lepke. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Uh, the information has been really helpful. So my question is for Dr. Lepke. Um, awesome. So I'm, I'm kind of, and again, I, my apologies in advance in case it has been mentioned before. I joined the meeting a little late. So uh, my understanding from the whole thing that has been discussed so far is you go to Puerto Rico, you get the license. For, you, you work for a year, then you get the license. So do yeah. you come back to the United States and you go into residency or you bring the licensing and then you start practicing as a physician and bypass residency altogether. So that part is a little easy for me. Could you clarify, please? So, so actually in the process I'm doing, uh, doctor, uh, is that uh, as soon as I did my internship and I got my license, I worked for a while. And after that, I came to the States. I already have my NPI number. It's the same one as the one I used in Puerto Rico. The only change is since I started residency here, the license number I had in Puerto Rico changed. I'm going to be start using the license number I have over here. So when I finish in two years, I'm going to be using my same NPI, which I use in Puerto Rico. It's the same one. But the license number is different because now I pass from general physician to a specialty, which is family medicine. So my license in that way changed. But if you would have stayed as a general uh, medicine in Puerto Rico and you use the same license from over there and you came over here to work as a general doctor, Usually the, the license number is the same. The only difference, you got to pay a different fee so you can keep on using th that license here in the United States. That's the only difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so either options work, works. Like you can still do residence in the United States, right? Definitely. So yeah. Do you do the internship all over or do you just go straight to second year in the U.S.? No, I went directly to my first year residency, first year. Okay, got you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, yeah, just to add a little, just to add one one or two voice to that. So 
this, uh, from what I understand, what Dr. Lecky and Dr. Martinez, uh, pardon me, said is there are two ways. You finish in Puerto Rico. There are three ways. Finish in Puerto Rico, stay there, you get a good job. Mm -hmm. Finish in Puerto Rico, you come to the U.S. There is a category, you know, what we, what we commonly have, <clears throat> what we commonly know is family medicine, internal medicine, that is like the subspecialties. Yeah. There's a category in the U.S. that is called general practice. I know people don't often talk about that, but there's something called general practice in the U.S. where yeah. you walk in, um, um, is it military hospital, what they call VA, VA hospitals, yeah. Yeah. you walk in state agencies, you walk under areas of uh, areas of uh, healthcare needs. You also walk in, you know, like the several state agencies, even some federal agencies also, prison facilities. You're functioning as a physician. You can also work in nursing homes. So that, that Puerto Rico license can also enable you to do this independently. Exactly. And then you walk. You can also use a Puerto Rico license as a way to show recency of practice and then argue your way into residency. I don't know if I'm correct. You're correct. Totally correct. No. That's true. Okay, sorry, Doctor Dr. Edward. Just a quick one. I'm sorry. Um, sure, no problem. Go ahead. I don't, I don't mean to be selfish. Uh, so, um, how is this uh, Puerto Rico pathway different than uh, on areas? I see that in there's some uh, Puerto Rico hospitals for residency. So, is this pathway that Doctor Lepi described different than those ones for areas? I can answer that. Okay, so sure. it's it's not so different, Doctor. Actually, because most of the hospital that offer those residencies, those hospitals also offer the internship. And most right. of the time, if you get into a, one of those hospitals where you do the internship first for the first year, if they say if they see you work really good and really hard, they usually pick those candidates for to stay there in the residency. That is another goal and it's another option that you guys could be also having. But since not everyone is so lucky to get into those residency, so a lot of people, what they do is when they finish the internship, they try to get their license and start working as a general practitioner, as Dr. Edwards was saying. Okay. Okay. Got you. Thank you so much. Really helpful. Yes. I appreciate it. Yes. Brilliant question, Dr. Toro. I want more people to ask more. Uh, Dr. Chu, can we stretch it a little bit for like five more minutes, Dr. Lepke? I know you guys yeah. have things to do. Yeah, let's stretch sure. it a little bit. Um, more questions for Dr. Chu. Dr. Chu, just give us a, a summary of it so that when the questions begin to ask, I encourage everyone to unmute your mic, uh, turn on your microphone, turn on your cameras, and let's have let's have a party of questions. This is a rare opportunity May to I see people who have actually done this. Like, so we're not bringing hypothetical scenarios. These are people who have gone through these pathways, and then they are here to you know help us get this information on the streets. Yeah, go ahead. Someone was about to say something. Dr. Duak, was it? Was that you? No, it wasn't me. Oh, okay. No, good evening, everyone. Sorry, mm -hmm. this is um yes. Uh thank you, um, all doctors, Dr. Um Chu, Dr. Lepi, and you the two, Dr. Edwards. Um, just wanted to um um add something though. Um I think when you said the at uh, the VA, you 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 can work as a general practitioner. That used to be, not anymore. You have to go through residency, mm, pass exactly. your boards, become board certified before you can work at the VA. Not anymore. Mm. They don't mm. have those openings anymore for general practitioners. Mm, okay. I see. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yeah. Okay, Doctor Lecky, you have a you want to say something? Well, actually, I, actually, I don't know after last year, but two years ago, actually, I have a cousin of mine who's right now working for the VA in Kentucky, and she just went with her with her general practitioner licensed from Puerto Rico. I don't know up to date right now, so it could be mm -hmm. true. But at least two years ago, I knew she went in and 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 got into the VA, and actually, she's working right now over there in Kentucky. I don't know now. I don't know now. Just in mm -hmm. case. Amazing information, Dr. Lane. Dr. Lane, if you don't mind putting your camera so that we can see you, that name looks like the first time I'm seeing that name, or probably you're using your special name so that we can at least get to know you. Any other questions? Do we have to do USMLE step one and step two before being eligible to practice in Puerto Rico? Dr. Lucky, you want to take that? Not necessarily, but the options are going to be much better for you guys if you have the steps because hospitals over there are looking a lot for that now. But at the same time, you can be also taking the, the boards from Puerto Rico. There's one, two, and three boards of Puerto Rico that will help you also to get your license. But if you have the boards from the United States, the USMLE will be much, much better and better looking in your resume for the hospitals over there. 
Thank you so much. I want everyone to pay attention to the chat room because Dr. Chu is dropping tons and tons of uh, information that will be very helpful. Copy all of them because after Zoom meeting, it's going to go away. And then in recordings, the, the Zoom meetings doesn't record what we chat. Any other question? If there's no other question, we're going to thank you so much. Let me pause for two minutes and see if there are going to be other questions. Um, um, I have a question, please. Sure, sure. Um, so for the Puerto Rico internship, do the hospitals um, sponsor visa or you would have to get your visa before going there? Some of them do, some of them don't. So okay. before you apply the, to the hospital, make sure you send them an email and ask that. But some okay. of them do and some of them don't. All right. Thank you so much. You got it. Thank you, Jato, uh, Chi, G, Jennifer, for the question. I'm scrolling through the chat to be sure we're not missing anyone. Please bear with me if I missed any of your questions. It's not intentional. I'm trying to coordinate one million things at the same time. In closing, Dr. Chu. Uh, what do you want? What do you want me to summarize? Yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> Dude, what's going on, man? Come on, man. Um, honestly, uh, just resilience. Resilience is the key to the game and maintaining your enthusiasm for medicine. Um, it, it's the only thing that will uh, push you through the countless rejections and what appears what is possibly stigmatization because of where you're coming from and where you studied and your boards and your year of graduation. Um, it's enthusiasm and persistence and prayer and, and finding the right connections. Um, so be thankful for Dr. Edwards because of his, his desire to give back to his community. It's very rare and it's commendable. Um, and yeah, and just uh, just keep that up. Uh, that's the only thing I can give you because that's the only mindset that's going to get you into residence. Yep. It's not going to be um, the numbers. It's going to be the personality. Uh, there's a lot of people who score 240, 220, 230, mm -hmm. and their uh, their CVs are amazing and they haven't matched. And it's not because they're not capable. It's just that they didn't have the persistence uh, to see it through. Uh, and it's nothing against their character. It's just it's just something that you need to have. Um, so the I think they said, can we just apply for internship positions directly? So yeah, the the two positions that I put there, they're not just to be clear, they're not residency positions. They're a separate internal. That means you are put in front of residency programs, but you're not considered a first year resident. You're just considered like almost like a sub a sub intern. Um, but uh, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, left you, you're, you're not actually yeah. like a, a first year resident. You're just doing a, a rotation, like a transitional yeah. rotation. And yeah. that will allow you to get in front of people to exactly. Then you to start from possibly get yeah. into residency. Yeah. And then you start again residency from zero. Yeah. Uh, before your closing remarks, at left you, Dr. Chu, are most grateful. Uh, for your time and how busy you are coordinating a whole lot of stuff. He's the power brain behind our didactics in my program, and he's an um, amazing guy. Um, yeah. Part of his can strategies... I just, can I say, say something quick? Yeah. So before I leave, um, just from my part, Dr. Shu and Dr. Edwards, I just want you guys to say ne this, and never always remember this, never give up. OK, like I said before, all of us have our own stories. All of you guys have your own stories. If you really want it, work hard. Just like Dr. Chu said, just because you did good boards doesn't mean you're going to go in. You need to have a lot of stuff, the whole combo, all around. So never give up. Fight for your dreams. We all did. We are here. We're working hard. And if we did it, you guys can do it too, okay? So never okay. give up. Amazing. Don't go yet because you're going to give a summary of the whole um, in internal pathway. You know, people are joining us at different time, and I'm assuming other people are sending me messages that can't join. We'll keep this recording and uh, with your special permission, we're gonna post it on our Facebook channel. We have a Facebook channel. Um, there are several, several things to do to get into residency, especially when you're finding it difficult. One of them is to put a foot into the door, a foot into the door. So anything that's gonna bring you a foot into the door, find a way to do it to the most that you can. Confidence, foot into the door means getting into internal program, assistant physician programs, uh, 
get it into programs that do extend shapes, you know, somewhere that they could see you because many of these programs, they also want to know who they want to take. So if they see you that you're doing well, um, they're going to take you. Uh, Dr. Lecky, in one minute summary, and then I will exit both of you. Thank you so much. Amazing conversation we just had. So, so actually, like, like Dr. Edwards said, Dr. Shu was really clear about it. Try to get your foot. But the door opens a little bit, you guys got in and you guys work everything else, okay? But at the same time, you got to work hard, move, do a lot of stuff, research, work, internships, go away here, go over here, work, make sure you have that personality. They see you're working. They see you're capable, capable of doing everything and overall that you love what you do. Make sure you they see that you love medicine and you, you do it because of your heart and you love it. As long as you get that food on the door, like Dr. Edwards said, it, nothing is impossible. The sky is the limit afterwards. Thank you, guys. Uh, great, great bodies. I call them. One is my mentor. One is my colleague. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll continue our conversation tomorrow. And uh, anytime uh, we have other things, please feel free. Open your doors for me. We have a lot of people that are trying to you know, get in just like we tried so hard and eventually got a little piece of information like this that uh, matter a lot. For their contact, we're not going to share it. If you have any email, send it to the email we dropped on the group chat. I'm going to forward it to them. If they want to share with you personally, that's up to them, but I'm not going to betray the trust that I also, that I give them. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to remove you from the group. Uh, and then we're going to keep talking. Thank you, Lepke. Thank you, Papi. Thank Love you. Guys. Thank you Have you. a good All one. Right. Take care. Take care. All right. So that was the conversation, everyone. We're going to stop the recording so that we can go into um, into the ordinary session where we you know, talk about other things. And because of time, we try to be respectful of people's time. We're not going to talk beyond five minutes or 10 minutes, uh, things that we want to address. We know that there's some groups that want to give group reports. I wish that uh, before then, this is the first episode of uh, the journey to fellowship, journey to residency, journey to you know things beyond where you are standing. Um, in 2024, we intend to intensify our efforts as a research group to do lots of things uh, moving forward. Thank you guys, I'll stop the recording. My name again is Dr. Kobe Edwards, I'm the convener for this group, thank you.